steps of a good man, the Bible says, are ordered by the Lord. Romans 8 says that we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. So the steps that you're taking are ordered by Him. Maybe there's been some missteps. Maybe somebody tripped you up. Maybe there's been a surprise along the way, but have hope. All things work together for those who love God on another they're called according to His purpose. The next verse says, For whom He foreknew, He also predestined. Those steps for your life have been preordered. For whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. You're being formed into a brother of Jesus Christ. Moreover, whom He predestined, these He also called. Whom He called, these He also justified. Whom He justified, these He also glorified. There's just steps going on in your life. He's not surprised by what's happened to you. He'll take it and use it. Maybe it's something you did to yourself. Don't beat yourself up. Run to Him and sing this song. Order my steps, Lord, in Your Word. Order my steps. Hallelujah. I want to walk worthy. Let's make this our prayer. I want you walk worthy. don't have to goad us, but that we run to you saying, give me my orders for today, Lord. Lord, what's your orders for us this week? What steps are you wanting to do with my life? Lord, I don't want to be a difficult child. I want to be a, an obedient child, ready to follow your will. Thank you, Lord. Can we give him praise for his grace and his long suffering with us? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. in our life and in our work, Lord, and in our walk and in our talk, that our lives are lined up with your eternal purposes and not our own. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you turn to Hebrews, the 12th chapter? Following chapter 11, which talks about faith and the heroes of faith, Chapter 12 begins with these words, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, great in the context of their number, or great in the context of their heroic testimonies, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. 
because we also will have a testimony of heroic faith if we'll do this. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. You got a pen? Just circle the word us there. Looking unto Jesus. Here's how we do it. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. We've been talking about the love of God the dimensions of the love, and the demonstration of the love. The dimensions of the love, it's so wide you can't get around it so long, you can't get past it, so deep you can't get under it, and so high you can't get over it. And like the song says, but you got to come through the dough. God's, God's love is so wide you can't measure it because it's as far as the east is from the west. He removes our transgressions from us. His love is so long it begins before creation. When he predestined the Lamb of God to be slain from the foundation of the world, where he predestined you and I to be his followers, begins there and goes into the ages to come. His love is so deep, it begins from the throne all the way down to the lowest elevation on the earth's surface. A lot of people don't know that Israel has some of the lowest elevation on the earth's surface. The Dead Sea is the lowest uh, body of water on the earth's surface, and the Sea of Galilee is the lowest, in terms of elevation, freshwater lake on the earth's surface. And that's where Jesus went. He went to the lowest. He lived uh, under the accusation of being an illegitimate son. Uh, he lived uh, under an oppressed regime. He lived under a despised race. He lived as a blue-collar worker. And he never sinned, but he was tempted in every point as we are. And became a sacrifice for us, took the place of a criminal, died on a criminal's cross, lowered himself all the way even into the grave. Hell, is, hell itself is at work. That's pretty deep, from the throne to the groan. His love is deep. And then he ascended, and he arose, and then he ascended from that depth all the way back up to the higher height than he left, because there's been given him a name that is above every name. That every knee should bow, that Jesus Christ is Lord. So God's love is wide, it's long, it's deep, and it's high. We talked about the demonstrations of God's love. How that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That God demonstrates His love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been saved through His death, shall we be saved by His life, the Bible says. And so... His love is demonstrated to us every day. It's incredible love. But today we're going to kind of complete the picture. You know, we live in a three-dimensional world. You don't quite have a grasp on God's love. And I alluded to it a few weeks ago when I said God loves you like you are, but He loves you too much to leave you that way. Amen. And it's as we yield to Him. It's not as we beat ourselves up and flagellate ourselves and flog our own backs as we pursue him and repent when he convicts us and we allow his life-changing hand we continue to hold to god's unchanging hand our lives are changed who knows he wants to change our lives amen so i believe today is going to be good good so let's look at verse three for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself lest you become weary and discouraged in yourselves in your souls You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which says to you, as to sons, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, you have had human fathers who corrected us. We have had human fathers who have corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. But he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful, for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. 
you're here at a special day. It's a premiere day. It's a premiere of a video, the first video produced by members of this church. Marietta Harrell wrote the script to this, and Josh and his wife put it together, and Josh is a narrator. Check it out. It's called Our Father is Different. If your father on earth was abusive, absent, emotionally detached, verbally or physically mean, if his words were accusatory, guilt-ridden, condemning, if he had no use for you, ignored you, reviled you, if he turned his back on you, if he was disgusted with you and never had a good word for you, If nothing about you was ever good enough for him, know this, your Father in Heaven is different. If you had the kindest Father on Earth, if your Father encouraged you and supported you, if his words were words of life, if he was there for you regardless of your successes or failures, If he hugged you with arms filled with love. If he attended all of your accomplishments. If he loved you through all the difficult moments. Know this. Your father in heaven is better than the greatest dad. Our father in heaven is good beyond our ability to measure good. He is always with you and doesn't want to leave you. He never condemns, never destroys the good in you that bears fruit. He's never disgusted with you. He will never give up on you. He has a plan and a purpose for you in the kingdom of God here on earth. He wants only that which will push you to your full potential. He guides you towards your destiny, always correcting your course so that his perfect course for you is maintained if you heed his voice. He speaks words of life always over every one of your successes and over every one of your failures. He isn't abusive, but administers admonishment with a heart filled with love. He doesn't spare us pain if that pain will keep us on his road, will help others, or will be a light to those still in darkness. No, he is your perfect father who loves you beyond anything you can ever comprehend. Our Father is different. Our Father is different. Our Father is different. As humans, we're often given to extremes, one extreme to the other. It's incredibly displayed in fathers. Maybe your father went too far. Maybe your father wasn't there or didn't go far enough. Either way, there's a price to pay, but God is here to heal. Who can say amen? Do not allow the image of someone who should have represented God in your life to keep you from pressing through those hurts and wounds to getting to know God is your heavenly Father. I'm speaking this morning on the discipline of God's love. Can we say that together? The discipline of God's love. Maybe you've read Hebrews 12 before and have full understanding of all of its ramifications. But I would just encourage you just to kind of Put what you know on the shelf and just approach this concept, this truth, as though you're hearing it for the first time. Because there may be something here for you that you'll miss if you make sure I dot all the I's just right and and cross all the T's just right to suit your understanding. So sometimes something may sound like it's crossing what you know to be true, but stay with me to the end before you turn me off, all right? The discipline of God's love is the truth of God's is the truth of the scripture. 
If all we stay with is the dimensions of his love and the demonstration of his love and we don't go any further, we're living on milk and not meat. It's true. And um, we've got to move on to meat. It's important that we don't get milk and meat mixed up, though. You know, in the, under the law, there was a, there's a kosher diet that Jewish culture still practices where you don't have dairy products with butcher's products. You don't mix the two. If you have pizza with cheese, there's no meat on the pizza if it's a kosher, if it's a kosher dish. I think theologically there's an application there. It's important to know that God loves us and that we don't mix the meat in with us. He doesn't love us because of what we do. He doesn't love us because of how we submit He loves us because He chose to love us. He doesn't love us because we're worthy or because we are mature. He loves us like we are. All right? Let that truth stand. And then let this truth not contradict that truth, but let it be line upon line, precept upon precept. Many times as Christians, we'll learn one thing and not allow anything else to be built on it, or we replace everything we've ever learned with that one thing. We become extremists. Line upon line, precept upon precept. God loves me. That is a foundation of the Christian faith. Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. And because that is true, this is true. Because He loves us, He wants to help us. He disciplines us. How many, how many are glad the person sitting beside you has been potty trained? <laughs> right. There's been some discipline in your life. Somebody loved you enough to discipline you when you didn't know that stink stank. Right? So it is because God loves me beyond the point of my understanding, because He loves me, He wants to lead me to higher ground than what I've been living in. It's true. How does He love me? How? He loves me. He disciplines me in love. Hebrews 12, 6 says, For whom the Lord loves, He chastens, which is the word for discipline, and scourges every son whom He receives. That's a stronger form of discipline. How strong is God's scourging? As strong as it has to be. He has great wisdom. He will not go beyond what you can handle. He will not go beyond what you need. He doesn't speak louder than he has to. It's his will to just whisper and us respond. But if we won't heed him, if we won't... Have that heart that says, lead me, guide me in your word. He'll allow us to reap the consequences for our rebellion. And those circumstances will be screaming at us, hello, you're going the wrong way. The contemporary English version says, Hebrews 12, 6, like this. The Lord corrects the people he loves and disciplines those he calls his own. The Message Bible says it's the child he loves that he disciplines. The child he embraces, he also corrects. And the New Living Translation, I love this. For the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes each one he accepts as his child. This is the Lord's doing in our life. Now, as we grow children up, we have to reward them for good behavior and punish them for not so good behavior, right? And may God give us wisdom to not overdo it, on either side. You know, don't give your kid a giant trophy for, for something that the world's going to mock him for doing. Oh, great, you're potty trained. That's awesome. Why the big trophy? You know. <laughs> They'll be disappointed because they don't hear applause when they go use the restroom. So we've got to prepare our kids to live in the world. little humor there, very little. So God disciplines us in love. Jesus said in Revelation 3 to the church there in Laodicea, I believe it was, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, oh boy, everybody loves this verse. But look at the context. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. That's his plan of instruction in our life. 
That's his discipline plan, is for us to open the door to our heart every day and spend some time with him. But if we won't do it, there can be some consequences. Because he loves us. Now, sometimes those consequences are reaping what we sow. We'll get, we'll get back to that here in a minute. So how does he discipline us? In love, all right. Who does he discipline? The discipline of God's love. Who's this for? His children. It's for us all. Not just the disobedient. And it's not just when we're dis- disobedient. God is disciplining us for a purpose. He's not just wanting us to be potty trained. He's not just wanting us to learn how to overcome some sin. He's wanting us to be conformed to the image of His Son. Hebrews 12.8, But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. See, God loves us too much to not help us. Right? And if He didn't love us like that, we really wouldn't know that we're His children. The disciplining hand of God, if you look at it the right way, should bring comfort to your soul and faith to your heart and renewal to your mind. He loves me. He cares about my character. He cares more for my future character than my present comfort. Write that down. God cares more for our future character than our present comfort. Look at the past, some things He's brought you through. And the change has come about in your life. How he used those things, not that he maybe caused those things or authored those things, but you can't hand him a mess that he can't make a message out of. You can't, you can't create a test that he can't give you a testimony of how he brought you through. And it will change your life. The King James Version isn't so kind. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers... Then are you bastards and not sons. Arr! The New Living, if God does not discipline you as he does all his children, it means you're illegitimate and are not really his children at all. The writer of Hebrews is just making a point to not get mad at God. God, your word promises me. What's, what in the hell is going on? Well, he's developing patience in your life. And I've got bad news for you. Sometimes we say, oh, don't pray for patience. But you know what? God's got a plan to make you patient, whether you pray for it or not. You're being tested in that area. Pray, God, help me. Tribulation works patience. The Bible says it. Who does he discipline? He disciplines his children. The contemporary, contemporary English version says God corrects all his children. If he doesn't correct you, then you don't really belong to him. So if everything in your life is going perfect and this is Greek to you, let me tell you about the Christian faith. (laughs) No, enjoy his blessings. It may be that you're meeting with him every day and he's whispering to you. He's not having to allow other things to happen. All right. Who does he discipline? Why does he discipline us? Why? Because we're in training. How is he disciplines in love? The who is his children? The why is we're in training. Hebrews twelve nine through eleven says we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? Now the book of Hebrews was written to Hebrew Christians who had the Old Testament, which has many amazing scriptures about child rearing. And it's, there's a verse in there that says, spare the rod. I know Ben Franklin said, spare the rod, spoil the child. But the Bible says, spare the rod, hate the child. What does that mean? It means a kid that you raise without any discipline, you'll wind up hating that person. You know, parents have, fathers have killed their kids. Just think about it. Give some discipline. For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. Now imagine a Jewish father raising these people who one day will become believers. And they did their best. 
for a few days. You know, your childhood's not that long. The older you get, the smaller portion of your life your childhood becomes. And so I believe the writer of Hebrews was an older man. He says a few days they chastened us. It seemed best to him. But he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. When he disciplines us, it's not just because he thinks we need it. He knows we need it. He's not guessing. He does it. And it's tailor-made for you. Tailor-made for you. Now, I know of some people's abusive parents, if one kid did wrong, everybody got whooped. Because they're supposed to prevent one another from doing wrong. But then, if you do that, then they get whipped for tattling. I mean, it's like a, just a setup to be whooped. God the Father's not like that. Verse 11, now no chastening seems to be joyful. If you love whipping, then there's something else we need to minister to. No chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Now when we raised our kids, five was the big number. Five of them. Five swats if they had it coming. That was the limit. And so mercy, maybe three, maybe two, maybe one, maybe four. So the big question when they were in trouble was, how many? And, and, and the way we disciplined our kids was very minor compared to the way I was disciplined. So they'd just go into this big drama, and I'd start laughing. This is just hilarious. They thought Dad was sadistic. Dad, you're evil. You're laughing. But let me tell you. When you discipline your child, there's peace, is there not? It works. It works. The Board of Education applied to the seed of knowledge in the correct way works. We're in training. We've been predestined. I read that verse earlier. Or earlier. Earlier. (laughs) Discipline my tongue, Lord. That verse earlier. We're going somewhere. And it's not just breaking bad habits. It's becoming like Jesus. So that heaven will be a wonderful place. Full of people that are being conformed and have been conformed or more conformed than they ever were to the image of Jesus. Because in heaven we're known as we are known, right? If God's not disciplining these kids here, guess what heaven will be? Earth too. Some people get mad at God. If there's a real God, why does he allow such wickedness on the earth? Because this is in heaven. His will isn't done here. That's his prayer request. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And they talk out of both sides of their mouth. Why? If God's a good God, then why can't everybody go to heaven? Because then you would have earth too. We're in training. This is what it would be like if he didn't discipline us. Good morning. Good morning, Madison. Good morning, Johanna. Good morning, morning. Johnny. People are always asking me why. Why do the same thing every year? Why not move on? But I say if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Johnny? Present. I'm comfortable. I know the routine. United States of America and I don't want to brag, but I'm pretty popular around here. I do really well in sports. No! No, my mom! Well, I'm just very successful yes. here. Why would I go and mess that up by graduating? B. But I mean, in the first grade, I may not know all the answers. D. D. Dog. E. The hours are longer. I hear they don't even have nap time. I mean, I just don't see the upside. Then first grade leads to second grade, second to third. Then you're in high school reading boring books with no pictures. Three, four, five. But he was still Still hungry. hungry. Next thing you know, people expect you to get a job and give up summer vacation. (laughs) No, sir. I think I found my niche. Thank you very much. Home sweet kindergarten. Besides, I mean... What if I failed first grade? How humiliating would that be? Nope, just don't think I could handle that kind of embarrassment. I owe you an 
like some kind of motor. Why you? That was not a good choice. Very disappointed. Ouch! Now, I'm an exhorter. If you don't get the point, I'll just hammer on it a hundred more times. When it came to disciplining my parents, my dad had the right balance between lecture and discipline. My mother, the lecture was so long, it's like, Mama, go ahead and whip us. Please, we can't take no more lecture. And I'm like my mom. I can hammer. If you don't get it, you got the point, I think, that, that we need his discipline because we need it. If we don't, then, you know, Paul rebuked, I think, the Corinthian church for being immature, fighting with each other, having disagreements, said, you guys need some more milk. You need to know that God loves you and that he loves a person you can't stand just as much as he loves you. You need to let the milk do its work because you're not ready for the meat, which Jesus said, my meat is to do the will of him who sent me. Well, let me tell you, he had some strong meat to eat, didn't he? Strong He is our model. How, what, what are the ways that he disciplines us? Five ways, primarily built around the first two. Number one, he disciplines us through his Holy Spirit, through the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I, that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper, which is another name of the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. He's doing that in the earth, and he starts in the church. He starts in your life and in mine to convict us of sin, to show us how to be righteous, to show us the seriousness of these matters. The judgment day is coming, and it begins in the house of God. So today is our judgment day. Today is a day where he matures us where he gives us loving rebukes, which is a command to stop, change direction. Another way is through his holy word. We'll be singing that song again here in conclusion. David wrote, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. How do we hate false ways? Not in our own strength, but through the sweetness of the word. It brings understanding. It changes our value system. And it helps us grow. The word is the seed that if sown in good soil of our hearts will bear fruit of the life everlasting. Now, he wants to make us more fruitful. So sometimes he disciplines those who've been very fruitful. You want scripture? John 15. I am the vine, you are the branches. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit is cut off and thrown in the fire. Every branch in me that bears fruit is pruned so that you may bear more fruit. Now, I've never worked on a vineyard, but I understand when it's pruning time, sometimes vineyard owners will will hire someone else to come in and prune their precious vines because they just can't do it as, as harshly as it needs to be done. And so it is in our life. He disciplines us all because he's got us on a journey. You say, we're on a journey. Amen. It took him just like the Southern Gospel song says, it took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and faithful he must be because he's still working on me. He disciplines us through his goodness. Now, many times our parents discipline us through anger, but God's anger is different. His anger isn't based on his being surprised. His anger is his goodness. He restrains his power of judgment to bless us when we don't deserve blessing, to wake us up, to convict us. My God, I'm not worthy of this blessing. 
If you, if you think all of the blessings in your life is God's confirmation of your maturity level, not necessarily true. It may be him trying to get your attention. Romans 2, 4 says, Do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? We don't realize his goodness leads us to repentance, and we don't repent when he's trying to be good to us to lead us to repentance. What other choice does he have if he's going to, he's going to let us reap what we sow? He disciplines us through his people. Jesus said, if you see a brother with a speck in his eye, get the log out of your eye and then go and deal with the speck. What is that? It's a blind spot. You go to someone with a blind spot in love, and hopefully if you don't see eye to eye, then you get a third party to come to a place of peace. I cannot tell you how many times that's happened in my life. People have come to me, or I've gone to people and left the log in my eye. And it, it's, it's so painful, but I tell you, it is life-changing when the reconciliation takes place. He uses us like sandpaper with one another. If someone rubs you the wrong way and you cut that relationship off, because the Bible says lay aside every weight. I know a guy that divorced his wife because the Bible says lay aside every weight. And she, was, and she was skinny. You are cutting off an agent of discipline in your life where God wants to make us more like him, through his people. Galatians 6, 1 says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. This isn't to punish But this is to admonish. This is to help restore. This isn't Catholicism. You know, the the priests have certain sentences for certain kinds of sins. You've had an abortion. You cannot taste the full fruits of forgiveness for ten years as commanded by the priest. That is not Jesus. He died for every sin, no matter how horrible. If you've had an abortion, he died to forgive you of your sin and to help you, to help you overcome the guilt and the, all, the, all the baggage that sin creates in our life to help us overcome. So as people who restore people who have fallen, we don't add to their problem. My God, that's terrible. You're bashing Catholics. No, I'm just telling the truth. James 5, 19 and 20, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns them back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Now, when it comes to what some might seem as punishment at the hand of a church, is this. If someone is going to be a bad influence on you and cause you to stumble, you are to withhold fellowship. If you see them, be nice to them, love them, but don't hang out with them. Because they'll drag you down. So there's what you do in that time, I call it making room for Jesus. Making room for Jesus. So it's not a permanent severing. Permanent severing, you're gone for life. No, you're just making room for Jesus. So that that person will miss Christian fellowship and will see the error of their ways because they're refusing to listen. They have to reap some consequences. They'll come around. So God disciplines us through his spirit, his word, his goodness, and his people. And finally, he disciplines us through his justice. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. When God lets us reap what we sow, is that considered discipline? I think so. Now, when our children are small, we're like helicopters. We just swoop in and pick them up when they fall and wop, 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 wop. Ah! Wop, 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 wop. But as our children grow, if you want your children to grow, you've got to stop being the helicopter mommy and daddy. You know, here's a grown kid. Wop, 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 wop. <laughs> your kid's an adult and you're still bailing them out of jail, you need to stop. So that if you love them, you will stop. 
If you love them, they will stop. I don't care what kind of guilt trip they put on you or whatever. Don't answer the, the $8 a minute uh, collect call, all that nonsense. Go see them on Visitor's Day. That way Jesus will say, I was in prison and you visited me. He didn't say I was in prison and you bailed me out. Right? Let them learn from the consequences. If you love them, right? you got to let them. Otherwise, otherwise you'll always be in that chopper. <laughs> so it is with God. When we're babies, man, there's incredible miracles happening left and right, getting you out of your messes. But then there comes a time when He expects you and I to begin to walk on our own under the power of the Holy Spirit, just like Jesus did. When we get off the path, consequences he allows it to happen for our good does he want it to no no but he gave us the ability to choose but he wants us to train our senses ourselves, so that we're not led by them amen through his justice in conclusion closing verses now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present but painful nevertheless afterward it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness, to those who have been trained by it. Proverbs says, discipline your child while there is hope. There is hope for us when God is disciplining us. Therefore, I believe this relates to those who are under discipline, that if you see someone reaping the consequences of their action, or you see someone going through a pruning season, don't become judgmental. Ah, it serves them right. Oh, boy. Judge not, lest you be judged. What are we to do? We're to help one another. This isn't being the chopper flying in and rescuing somebody. This is loving someone. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet. So, you know, take note of what's happening as well as strengthening those who are weak so that What is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. It's not his will that we fall away when we're experiencing some type of consequence or we're just going through a pruning or we're in a season where injustice has been committed. Trust me, nobody sins and gets by with it. If you are being sinned against, if an injustice is being committed against you, trust your destiny into the Father who sees everything. If you don't watch it, you'll get mad at him. Don't do that. It's not his fault. He, you know, he allows the world to have sin in existence. It's his will that we not sin, but it happens. Anyway, just let that be a word to whoever it applies. And in the meantime, we're to strengthen one another, help one another not to fall away when this happens. That which is dislocated, but rather be healed. If you go on and read the rest of the chapter, it gets into talking about bitterness. Don't become bitter at God. Now, I have to say this, and maybe I pick on televangelists too much. If I do, please forgive me, but with this sermon, I really do need to mention this. If you came into the kingdom on some kind of bargain, your life's going to be perfect. You're never going to have any problems. It's just going to be awesome. Some ear-tickling message. It tickled your itching ears. What's going to happen is when you see your Christian law not work out that way, you're going to get mad at God. Your word says, well, you look at one verse out of context, look at the whole picture, the whole counsel of God. Re-examine the ramp you came in on this thing on, and don't get mad at God. Just thank God for people that are you know, being used by the Lord to bring people in the kingdom, but pray for them that they'll, that they'll be more wise in their, in their deal. I, I visited with a pastor here a few years ago who used to scare people into the kingdom. He'd set dates for the rapture to take place. He's not doing that anymore. And I said, what was happening? He said, well, I was fishing with dynamite. <laughs> Guilt. <laughs> So if you became a Jesus follower under false pretenses or, you know, not the whole picture, I'm sorry. Would you please forgive us for not communicating clearly that the Father has a plan for your life and that he's not going to back down from it 
and that if you should fall, he'll help you get back up and he'll restore you, that his love for you is beyond your comprehension. And as you mature in him, he's not going to rescue you from every dilemma of life. Jesus said, here's the rest of the story, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So we follow a world overcomer. Read Hebrews 12 again before you pass sentence on this word. And don't become bitter at God. Don't become bitter at people. Trust Him that He is working forgiveness in your life so you learn how to be more forgiving even when an injustice is happening. And we pray. Praise team, come forward as I pray. Lord Jesus, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus that we would hear Your word with clarity, that we would see just how much You love us. And the goodness that is in the discipline that is going on in our lives. In Jesus' name, Lord, help us to grow and to follow you with all our hearts. And Lord, I believe that every person in this room will look back years from now and see, wow, that was happening. And Lord, I pray those that are able to look back years now, Lord, that more understanding of what is happening in their life would would become clearer and clearer and clearer. Lord, I thank you for your pruning. We have to be honest with you. We do not like it. But Lord, help us to cooperate with you. And Lord, may we sing this song. May this song be our life, Lord. In Jesus' name. Let's stand and end the service by singing this prayer.
read Hebrews 11. It tells us stories of heroes of faith out of the Old Testament. If you'll study many of their lives, they went through chastening processes. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Everything they went through prepared them for a greater good. Maybe you are in a cesspool in your life. God ain't done yet. I know that's not good English, but there's no better way to say it. He's not done. He's preparing you for a greater, more fruitful season. If Joseph knew he was going to be prime minister of the Egyptian empire, my God, he didn't know. We see through a glass darkly. But let me tell you, also, the Old Testament is filled with stories of people that were bitter. They're not listed in Hebrews 11 necessarily. Esau. Samson. Saul. Absalom. Men who would not embrace the humbling hand of God. God is awesome. God is awesome. He's doing a great work in your life. He who began a good work in you will complete it for the day of Jesus Christ. If you need to pray somewhere, we're going to sing this again. Make your chair an altar or come to the front and pray. Let's end the service singing this prayer. You must go. You must go. Give you this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord God, Yahweh Himself, lift up His countenance upon you and give you His peace. And may His discipline in your life be a joy. As you know that He's not done. He's not leaving you where you are. He's moving you on ahead. Hallelujah. God bless you. Order my steps in your word. Please order my steps in your word. Let's sing it again.
your word.